Hi, on today's episode of the Full Life Podcast, I talk with Vicki Simpson, who is a national and internationally recognized prophet and preacher who is sought after by churches, conferences, boards, and businesses around the globe. Today we talk about prophecy. What is it? What's its role within the church? Uh, Is that gift available to everyone? And what's the difference between the gift of prophecy and having the role of uh, having the office of being a prophet? Vicky also has some great advice for anyone who is struggling to hear from God. And my very favorite part of the conversation is towards the end when I ask Vicky, what is God saying to the church in Australia during the season of the pandemic? Enjoy this conversation with Vicky Simpson. Vicky, welcome to the Full Life Podcast. Hi, Mel. Thanks for having me. Now, you're a prophet, an itinerant minister, a passionate, faith filled woman of God who has really paved the way for women in ministry in my generation. And I'm really excited and honored to be chatting with you today. So how about we get started with, let's get to know you a bit. Introduce yourself to us, your family, what you do and where you live. Uh, Well, uh, I'm an Aussie-Italian hybrid. So Aussie mum, Italian dad. I was born and bred in Perth. Um, I haven't lived there, however, since 1992. Um, And since I lived in Brisbane for a season, Noosa, then Adelaide, and now my husband and I, uh, Damien, my husband and I live in Sydney. So, um, and I'm, I'm in the ministry, have been uh, since 1992. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, travel, but clearly during this whole COVID-19 uh, season, it put uh, traveling to a, an abrupt halt. And, um, and so at the moment, this is the main way that I'm ministering through the lens. Virtually, yeah. <laughs> Virtually, yeah. That's right. So how are you doing that? You're running Instagram lives every Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m. Yeah, well, that's that's a labour of love, that one. But mm-hmm. um, which, yeah, that, um, that's sort of my opportunity to help um, profile the prophetic and a lot of the Aussie prophets who people don't know about because most of the, the prophets in Australia are pastoring <laughs> or right. they yeah. there's only, there's only a handful of us who actually are known mm. for doing this full time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just that, that Thursday 4 PM um, Insta live is just my own initiative and some, and some fun, but I'm still managing to, um, minister for churches, doing pre-recorded messages. I mm-hmm. uh, did my first Sunday live stream for a church last week. Um, so, you know, that's because reality is it's also my uh, livelihood. It's that's right. uh, Yeah, so yeah. it's, but it's been amazing considering three months ago, uh, between Damien and I, we didn't know how we were even going to pay the bills. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it, it's been remarkable. The Lord mm-hmm. has um, has really surprised us in the ways that He's provided. So, yeah. so still managing to be fruitful, still and 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 um, some in- amazing doors op- have opened in this time. Some um, unexpected opportunities. I've been praying to have um, some sort of ministry opportunity in Italy for probably nearly thirty years. Wow! And um, I'm actually getting to speak online for a women's conference in Italy um, in the next couple of weeks. That is so <laughs> exciting. So, yeah, very exciting. And now I felt the Lord say to me at the beginning of this season, it was going to be a season of divine paradox. Wow. And so where it looked like, you know, the natural was saying, stop, stop, that mm-hmm. actually be a season where a lot of things would start. You yeah. know, it, when it looked like it'd be a season of disconnection, that there would actually be a lot of connection. Mm-hmm. Um, that everything that how it would appear in the natural that God was actually going to uh, reverse it. There would be something a, a, a re, like a as I said, a divine paradox taking place, and that's it. that's how it's been shaping up for us. <laughs> yeah, certainly, definitely. So let's go back to talking about the Instagram lives. I really love yeah. that you're having a conversation about 
about prophecy because Thank you. for me in, in my own circles, I don't hear, um, you know, prophets being spoken yes. of a lot. I'm not sure if yeah. that's Australia wide. It is wise. pretty much. Yeah. 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 It is pretty much. And, um, and probably for the last couple of decades, uh, the most common and accepted church model has been one that's been focused on a pastor leader model, the language mm -hmm. of pastors and leaders. And some of the other ministries are kind of being pushed a bit more to the fringe or else not um, a part of the everyday language. Mm -hmm. and, and so I actually, my conviction is that we're going to see some changes yeah. and that the um, fivefold ministry will be come yeah. more yeah commonly um understood as mm -hmm. as you know key builders of the church so Great. um and equippers of people obviously so so yeah, yeah i just for my part you know i've been burdened by it for for some time and for the next generation i, I mean i feel quite a responsibility for the next generation of Great. prophets and prophetic ministries that they have uh one's more experienced ones that they can look to and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that they can uh, learn from. And, and what most common feedback I've had from these Insta lives is, is people contacting me and saying, I don't feel quite so strange anymore. Excellent. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, you know, young people, half of my, um, half of the people who engage with me on Instagram are under 40. So they're all in their twenties and thirties. Mm -hmm. so um for, for me that was really positive and really encouraging because that's really who yes. i want to reach yeah you know, they're the ones who have not had any modeling didn't have you know um you know the, the, the church experience like i had when i was in my 20s um when pr prophecy was was a regular thing and yeah. we had we had um recognized prophets in our church and yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that's the burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's excellent. That's good. I think it's really important to educate people what prophecy is, that it's a really important part of the fivefold ministry. So on that note, I'm aware that a lot of our listeners, like we've got some new Christians who are listening and we've got some people who are, are quite mature in their faith. And so to help people who are just beginning their faith journey to understand, sure. um, yeah. would you mind explaining what prophecy is? And then also what is it? Cause I've actually had quite a few people ask me um, yeah. this when they found out I was interviewing you tonight. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between how do you know that you're, you have the gift of prophecy uh, yeah. versus a call to be a prophet. So let's start with what is prophecy? My, my simplest definition that, that I give people is that prophecy is God speaking to people through people. Okay. God speaking to others through someone else. Um, now there's other expressions of the prophetic, like the prophetic anointing can be expressed through all sorts of music, dance, writing um oh my goodness just all sorts of different art mm. but if we're going to talk tonight about the gift of prophecy the spirit of prophecy revelations uh oh i've forgotten the quote it's chapter 15 that the, the testimony of jesus is the spirit of prophecy so basically uh anything that's prophetic the spirit of prophecy is jesus testifying jesus has still got something to say but the first corinthians 12 gift of prophecy is simply when God speaks to others, speaks to man through man, speaks, uses a human vessel to communicate what he wants to say now. I think that's important to know. It's a now word of the Lord. What, what, not what God has said, what he is saying now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So actually, let's also rewind. I want to know about your own journey of, of faith. Did you grow up as a Christian? Well, I, I grew up in, in a Catholic household. Yeah. Um, and we kind of, I went to church as a little girl with mum. I don't remember dad ever going to church unless it was for a, a wedding or a funeral. Um, and then uh, went to a Catholic girls' school. And about 15, age of 15, 16, 
kind of, I guess my spiritual hunger uh, was, was growing. What my experience of church wasn't speaking to me where I was at. I uh, felt like it was more. And to be honest, I wasn't expecting to find what I was looking for uh, in church. Mm. I tried different Eastern religion stuff. I um, experimented with some other spiritual stuff. Then hindsight was probably borderline occultish. But um, it wasn't until Christmas Day, 1980, I took myself to church. I just saw an advertisement in a newspaper and it turned out to be an AOG church, as it was known back then. Um, and I went expecting to hear about Mary, Joseph and baby Jesus being Christmas Day. And... Um, I was so impacted. I mean, I had that just to, in context, I, I had, um, I had met some born again Christians in the months leading up to that. So there was a whole number of people who had crossed my paths, sown seeds, people I worked with who had been witnessing to me. And but it was on that day that I, um, for the first time really experienced the tangible presence of God. I say that it was just as much about what I felt that day as what I heard. I mean, I heard I mean, the preacher preached from John 10, 10 that day, uh, being Christmas day. It, it was an interesting choice of verse, but the devil comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And I, had, I just remember being absolutely captivated. And I joined the dots at that moment because I would have said I was looking for the meaning of life or I was looking for a cause or looking for purpose. But I realized that I was looking for life. It was like, it was a ha moment. You know, the lights went on. I call it my blues brothers moment. You know, I saw the light and, uh, and then when I uh, was leaving the church and the pastor wished me a Merry Christmas at the door, he, he, uh, I think, yeah, I burst into tears, actually. <laughs> I just got Aww. really quite overcome. And so he grabbed my hand and he asked me if I'd given my heart to the Lord or given my life to Christ, something along those lines. And I didn't understand the question because I thought, well, I've been christened, first Holy Communion and confirmed three times that I know of. But, um, but so I said to him, well, I think so. But clearly, if you think so and don't know so, mm -hmm. you haven't. So, so he led me in a prayer. It was like, boom, just there and there on the doorstep. I didn't even know what I was doing. There, it was not like I had um, done an alpha course or anything. Yeah. And, but what, all I knew in my heart was that there were, I'd felt something. I'd heard a message about Jesus bringing abundant life, which I had never, ever made that connection either. I'd seen Jesus on the cross every day of my school education. And I mm. never, ever thought, okay, that is what I'm looking for. Mm. And, um, and so that was my, that was where... That moment, I surrendered my life to Jesus. Didn't know really what I was doing, but something shifted at that moment. I mean, getting born again isn't about a feeling, but I 100% felt something. I felt mm -hmm. some, I felt like the heaviness lift off. I, I, I sang all the way home, you know? I, um, and from that point on, I could not stay away. Mm -hmm. So... I um, I found a church that was closer to me, so I'd driven a little way to go to that one. Sorry, and just interrupting for a second. Yeah. How old were you? Sorry, Dal. How old were you? Nineteen. Nineteen. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so I joined a youth group and um, and got um, just sort of dovetailing this in with the prophetic. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit a few months later. And I think I got the gift of prophecy in the same dose. Wow. Because it wasn't yeah. long after that, that I started feeling that unction, um, mm -hmm. you know, to speak, to, to, to speak out impressions that I was getting. Yeah. So when were you getting these unctions? When you were in the middle of worship together at church or when yeah, you were at yeah. home? Yeah. Because the, the order of service back in those days was, um, was worship, uh, praise, worship, and then there'd be this lull in the service. You're probably too young to even remember this, Mel, but there used to be uh, yeah, a, a time where music would play softly and anybody who had something to say, anybody in the service who had 
a word of prophecy, tongues, interpretation, mm -hmm. anything like that. I'm talking like the early 80s. Yeah. Uh, there would be, people would take their opportunity. So I had, I was able to see that modeled. This is what mm -hmm. I think is so important about, uh, you know, the young generation seeing it and hearing it. Because for me, I, it was like uh, deep calls unto deep. And every time someone would prophesy in that part of the service, it's like my heart would start beating faster. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I it'd be like this excitement. Um, mm -hmm. And I sometimes would just get a thought and then someone would speak out the same thing. And so that happened a few weeks before I had the courage. And my first ever prophecy was, I love you, says the Lord. That was it. So we're talking about not personal prophecy, public prophecy mm -hmm. for the congregation. Yeah. And my second ever one was, you've got the victory, says the Lord. So, okay. you know, you, you start little. Fairly safe ones. Like they're not ones that you, you could possibly get wrong. <laughs> it's very scriptural. Yes. Very but I was so overwhelmed and I'd burst into tears every oh, wow. time. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I would feel it and um, you know, be very loud and emotional, which I learned to tame uh, some years later. But, um, but that, yeah, that's, that, that's where it started. Um, they're in church service or in youth group. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So as your church leadership started to recognize that you had the gift of prophecy, uh, how did they then, I suppose, champion that gifting in your life? Well, um, back in the day in, in the, uh, the church that I attended, they were part of a denomination that didn't recognize women in, in ministry, in um, any of the fivefold gifts, they didn't ordain women. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were some tight restrictions on what you could and couldn't do. Um, I was also a praise leader. Now, I look in hindsight, I mean, I, I went through uh, about probably 10, 11 years of great frustration because I felt like I was called to more. Mm. But within the, you know, the, the, the theological constraints of the time um, I couldn't do more but my pastor took a big step of faith and he uh, let me praise lead so not worship lead praise lead so the first few fast songs mm -hmm. um, and he copped a lot of flack for that I was the first woman in the apostolic church in Australia to even do that but yeah um, that actually that experience trained me in number one the platform so i did that you know faithfully i was usually on the roster once a month um sometimes twice for 10 years mm -hmm. that was that was my little I, was, I didn't do anything else i wasn't in leadership of any sort like i wasn't a a youth leader or a uh didn't run a connect group not that i didn't want to but i kind of felt like i was um I felt like I kept getting bypassed mm -hmm. uh, in favor generally in, um, of couples because I was single. Yeah. Uh, but in hindsight, it was really good training on a number of levels. So it, I got trained in uh, atmospheres, like being like having the responsibility basically of, of cracking open the meeting right mm -hmm. from the outset um, really helped me develop like a breakthrough anointing. Um, you know, help me, you know, build my confidence, um, in front of people. Um, and so my, I had brilliant discipleship. I had fantastic pastors who championed me as a person. Um, but there were restrictions around how far they could, you know, champion me. Like I never got to preach, um, except at the women's, at our women's meeting mm -hmm. and every, all of us had a go. So before I went into full-time ministry, I'd probably preached in to my entire lifetime six times. Okay. Yeah. So how did you go from this to being in full-time ministry? So in 1992, I, uh, I relocated from 
Perth to Brisbane. Initially, um, I thought it was going to be for five, five months uh, to do something called School of the Prophets, which was a, um, as the name suggests, was a prophetic training ministry. Uh, it was mm-hmm. based at Redcliffe COC back in the day under a guy called Chris Gabbert. And um, I went for my own personal development. I took leave without pay from my job and went with, with full expectation of coming back home to Perth at the conclusion. I used all my savings uh, to, to invest into that, into that training. And um, at the end of that, with only a matter of a week or two notice, I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to stay. And it was, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, ringing up and telling my parents I wasn't coming back was so, I mean, there was no preparation for it. There'd been yeah. no conversation. Yeah. I mean, I'd never been on my radar. Um, and when you're the only daughter and you're single, I mean, my dad in particular, um, what was, you know, Italian girls don't just don't do that. You know, you don't mm-hmm. go moving the other side of the country where the family isn't. And, uh, and I didn't even know why I was meant to stay initially. Like it was just the Lord said, stay. Mm-hmm. And so my poor mum literally had, had to pack my stuff, uh-huh. send it over. It was to, to add, um, add salt to the wound. And uh, there was a couple of, a few tough weeks because I had no money. Um, I'd run out of savings. I thought I was going back to my job. And then um, the pastor so Chris Gabbard, who didn't just head up School of the Prophets, he was the senior pastor of the church. Um, I remember him inviting me, uh, ringing me up and saying, so what are you doing? And I said, well, the Lord's told me to stay in Brisbane. He said, that's what I wanted to hear. He said, um, you know, I see the call of the prophet on your life. I want to apprentice you in the ministry. I want you to come on staff. So <laughs> that's how it started. So you had somebody actually say to you, like, speak it out, recognize yeah, that yeah, call, that office yeah, on yeah. you. And when he so said he, that, did that sit right with you, obviously? Well, it was, he'd already had a chat with me. So I was the, um, at the end of the training, I was the ducks of the, of the course. And I remember him calling me into his office. So that was like a few weeks before and, and saying to me, you know, I, I believe you're called to be a prophet. And I went, oh no, don't say that. I said, <laughs> And um, I said, I'm going to be going back home and like, this is not acceptable. You know, they look, I, I, yeah, perhaps, perhaps I am, but can I just call myself a woman of God, a servant or something, because this isn't going to sit well at home. And um, he said, no, it's really important that you know who you are. Um, the apostle Paul started all his letters, Paul, an apostle, called of the Gentiles. He said, very, he said, you could go and pray and see what God, God tells you. I went, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I thought it'd been hard enough as it, as it was, you know, without, um, without, you know, having that. But anyway, yeah. Um, I went, I remember going, going back home, um, going you know, back to where I was staying. I prayed and it's like one of those Bible just fell open moments mm-hmm. and um, fell open at Jeremiah chapter one um, where, you know, the call of Jeremiah called to be a prophet to the nation. You know, before you were, oh you my goodness. Through, knew, you know, <laughs> um, called you and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. You and, can't argue with that. Oh yeah. It was, and yeah, it was like a, a God shout moment. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's amazing because that call has been challenged on occasions. And I, it's one thing that I know it's that. <laughs> so it's, um, it is really important mm-hmm. when it comes to the call of God that, you know, Jesus even said how many times he said, I am, I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth and the life. I am the good shepherd, I am the door, you know, and even Paul said, by the grace of God, I am who I am. So at the end of the day, we've got to know, and I had yeah. to know who I am. <laughs> yeah. And I, I see that you've even put that in your Instagram bio too. 
the quote ah, of yeah, this is yeah. Story so you call yeah, is yeah. there? Tell me. So just for our listeners, so they know what it says is. Yes. Um, so you call yourself a prophet? Yes, actually, I do. Tell me the story <laughs> behind that. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, for many years, my bio would say prophetic minister, because it hasn't been, you know, sort of the 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 calling yourself a prophet isn't perhaps as um, common as, oh, I'm a pastor mm, or so even I'm true. a teacher, you know. Yeah. And I have had pushback over the years and, you know, and um, I don't know why, but people kind of um, just can react to it. So my, mm. my bio and my go-to for many years was I'm a prophetic minister. Yeah. But I felt really challenged by the Lord last year um, and he, he, he really more than encouraged me. I'm trying to find the right, the right words, Mel. Um, mm. I just had an incredible sense of conviction and weight of responsibility for the next generation of prophets. Yeah. And, and I felt the Lord say to me that he wanted me to self-identify for the sake of others. Well, okay. So I didn't, I didn't need to, like, I know who I am. Mm. I know who I am. And it hasn't, it hasn't, uh, you know, affected my ability to minister or, but I really felt God wanted me to be bold. Mm -hmm. So that for uh, the other prophets, young prophetic ministers, anyone with a prophetic call, who can I, who can I, go to who can I watch who can I learn from yeah um I was too I was too under the radar and people might think that's um sounds ridiculous considering how visible I might I might appear but um I know where I was playing safe and I know the burden that that came upon me mm. so I initially had on my Instagram bio I'm a prophet there. I've said it right. Mm -hmm. That was the first there. I've said it, which sounds ridiculous considering I've been doing this full time for 28 years, but, um, but there was something I had to break through for the sake of others, because I believe there'll come a time and the new gen prophets will be able to say, yeah, I'm a prophet and it won't cause people to arc up or, yeah. or you know, raise their eyebrows or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, then not long after I had someone, uh, contact me, direct message me on Instagram and um, with some not very nice things to say. And among them was, and you call yourself a prophet. Hence, I changed my bio and you call yourself a prophet. <laughs> well, actually, I do. Nice. <laughs> so, so that's the story behind that. Yeah. So do you think that there is a bit of pushback against somebody who might stand up and say, I am a prophet? Um, firstly, because as you said, a lot of people, you hear a lot of people being pastors and teachers, mm. even evangelists, but yes, to call yourself a prophet, you don't hear a lot of people come out and say that. And I guess also because there's a lot of responsibility to that. Like you're speaking the words of the creator God. So there's... Mm. There's that, <laughs> but I, so I, do you think it's because number one, it's not that common. Mm. And so, you know, people tend to be afraid and a bit iffy of, of things that they're not familiar mm. with. And number two, yeah. because of, of the high responsibility of, oh, so you actually, mm. you hear from the God. Yeah. Um, I think there's a, there's a few reasons and maybe there's a few I'm not even aware of, but, um, there were there was a like prof prophetic extreme that um, that was uh, I guess came into existence in the nineties. There was uh, you know the pendulum often mm. swings in the area of uh, church life, and there, there was a prophetic move in the early nineties, and um, but then it, it 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 got to the point of like prophetic dependence, like people would be coming to prophets asking for a word every two minutes. Um, that was the model. That was the paradigm. Uh, and so there was, 
some extremes and some of the key players in that, um, you know, did some dumb stuff, bought some discredit at the time. I know that there were, there are still pastors today who almost triggers them. You say prof, prophets or oh, prophetic yeah. and they're triggered because their memory is some of the yeah. extremes that they experienced in the nineties. Um, and which is a real shame because I think, there's been a collective throwing the baby out with the bathwater mm. and um, and there have been those of us who have continued to labor in this, in this area. Um, but there, I think there's been some suspicion and uh, you know, um, fear around it. Yeah. I'm, I don't know about, Talk to talk to some people recently about this, and we've wondered whether they're saying you're a prophet. If people kind of think it sounds like you're up yourself, you know, like oh, so you hear from God better than the rest of us, or something, which isn't the case. It's just a function, mm-hmm. yeah. And it's no more greater than any of the other. You know, the five are, to, are meant to work together. So, apostle, mm-hmm. prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. We all uh, have have. Uh, have functions, none better than the other, um, and none more important than the other. uh, I mean, all different different functions. I mean, the foundation of the church is built on apostles and prophets. Um, Mm. And so my dream is to see those two working side by side again. I um, I don't think it it happens as much as it could. It's often Mm. happening without people realizing it. Um, But... um, yeah, I think that, I think people still have an Old Testament paradigm as well of what a prophet is. Mm-hmm. Um, in 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 some ways, it would have been helpful if we were called something else, uh, because mm-hmm. it really isn't the same animal. Like the the old the New Testament prophet is not just a continuation of the old. How is it different? They're, they're not the same beast. Mm-hmm. Well, the it's just like the the, the priest and the prophet was re, replaced by the church. So the old, the old Testament priest was man's representative to God. The prophet was God's representative to man. But then that got replaced when Jesus came, died on the cross, resurrected, ascended into heaven, whoosh, sit down the Holy Spirit, which we, which we remembered on the weekend day of Pentecost Mm -hmm. and um, bam, the church was empowered. Now the spirit of God in all of us, not just on, the priests and prophets of the, you know, priests and prophets were the only ones who had that interaction with God on behalf of people. But now we all can. And so first Corinthians 14, 31 says we all can prophesy. John 10, 27 says my sheep hear my voice. Hebrews 1, 1 says God in former times spoke through the prophets has now spoken to us through his son. So it, mm. it, it, it makes a clear line that it's different now. And we're all kings and priests. We're a royal priesthood. So you only had, you know, the, 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 the priests of, the, the, of, of Levi, Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament. Well, now we're all priests. There was only the prophets who could hear from God and speak. About, well, we're, we all can prophesy. Yeah. And so, the, so the, the New Testament prophet came into existence after Jesus was ascended. Yeah. Ephesians 4 says Jesus ascended and gave gifts to men, as some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, continue, continue, maturing the body of Christ. And so it's, it's, it's a whole new beast. Yeah. It came into existence after the ascension of Christ. Okay, so we've, we've described what the gift of prophecy is. Yeah. So now... Let's describe what the office of prophet is. What would be kind of like your role description? Well, um, well prophets, I say we're like spiritual pseudofed. We clear the airways, help people to hear from God for themselves. That's great. So, yeah, our, our job is to release revelation. Excellent. To yeah. release the, what is God saying? Mm-hmm. So a teacher will will come and bring put light on what God has said. Yeah. The word, the logos, what God has said. Mm-hmm. The prophetic is a word from the word. Okay. A word from the logos, which in the Greek is rhema. 
Mm-hmm. So what God is saying. Um, so at the end of the day, prophets are about equipping the church to work, walk in revelation, equipping others to hear from God. It's not just what we hear and say is what God does with what we say. Yeah. And what we, what we say will birth things, will shift things, will open things, will pull down things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but it's all about empowering, Mm -hmm. empowering people. Okay. So on that note of empowering people, I'd like to direct the rest of our conversation around hearing from God and receiving personal revelation from him. Right. So I, I know someone who we've had a conversation and they just, they've been Christian for many years and they still struggle to recognize when God is speaking to them. So they've had times where they've set aside days of prayer and fasting because they had a big decision to make. And in the Mm -hmm. end they had, they felt like they hadn't received any clear rhema word for them. Mm -hmm. Um, But in the end they just, decided to make the best decision that they felt they yes. could and and it turned out pretty good for them so yeah. and then you know they just still struggle to feel like god is is speaking mm. to them so like i believe that god is speaking to them but what would you yeah. say to somebody who struggles to recognize god's voice yeah, well um i would say Word of God says, my sheep hear my voice. Yeah. John 10, 27. Not maybe here, possibly here, potentially here. You, you hear the voice of God. Sheep hear, whether they know it or not. It, it's usually that they don't recognize God's voice because they think it's going to be something else. Mm. A, a lot of Christians have, have this expectation it's going to be hard. Like it's a hard thing. The fact that your friend prayed and fasted and I'm all into prayer and fasting. Don't get me wrong, but actually hearing God's voice is a part of our salvation package. It's not an added extra that you earn through being really holy, really spiritual, praying and fasting. Jesus actually paid the price for it. I actually tell people, I've got my mobile phone here, uh, as it so happens. Um, I, um, I've got this phone. I can receive all sorts of communication, hear voices, downloads, emails, FaceTime. All possible because of this. All possible because of this device. And I, I, I say we all have a device of heaven. It's our spirit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have a, our spirit. I don't know if you can see here. I say I put it here. Our spirit. First Corinthians 6, 17 says, he who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with God. So our spirits are one spirit with God. It's not God up there. Christians so often are praying, I need to hear your voice, I need to hear your voice. And I think it's traveling from up there, like from heaven, a long way away. Oh, sure. No, mm. no, he's, he is on the inside. Absolutely. We, our spirit from that moment, no matter who, who's listening, no matter who you are, where you come from, what you've done, if you've received Jesus, you've received everything you need to hear his voice. And I pay Telstra and Arm and Alec for the privilege of being on their network, but Jesus paid the price for us to be on his network. Amen. So we've yeah. got the meat, we've got the device, we're on the network, but, but, but now it's just recognizing. It's recognizing his voice when he speaks. So I encourage everyone, firstly, be positioned in an expectation that this isn't hard. Yeah shepherds lead he's the good shepherd it's his job to lead we don't have That's to beg fine. him and we it's so you know jesus said according to your faith be it unto you he said that a few times according to your faith be it. so people have a faith and expectations it's going to be hard it will be but if they start to start to look at heaps of scriptures that just confirm the fact that he is willing to speak i, I think i think someone who thinks it's hard needs to how can I say it? God um, put more faith in his ability to speak than in your inability to hear. More faith in God's ability to speak yeah. than in your inability to hear. Yeah. We're, we're, we're always, you know, we're, we're earthen vessels. We'll, there'll always be stuff. 
happening. We'll always have issues. We'll always, there'll always, it's always be hindrances and this and that. Um, but, but the good shepherd, the good shepherd, and he is the light of the world. He deals in light. There is no darkness in him. He can't help but release light. I, I think, I, th I think some of us just need to relax and just start to thank him for speaking and thank you. If anyone's watching this and they happen to be at a crossroads and I'm kind of sensing right now that there are some listening and they're really, oh, I need to make a decision. I need to know your will. I need to know your will. Well, he, he wants you to know his will even more than you do. <laughs> it's his will. Like it's not. And yes, he's got a still small voice, but he can shout if he has to. And he can speak all volumes in between. So people sometimes are like, oh, it's still small voice of God. And I can't get, and if anyone has got any like anxiety issues and they've got noise going on, they think it's impossible to hear God, but it's not because he knows who you are. He knows how to get, get through to you. Hmm. And often it's just the thought. Now, this is the thing. This is where some people um, get stuck as well. God speaks and they hear it. They either hear the thought or you know, they get something, they get a scripture or if there's been a conversation and something's really hit them or they've been listening, preaching in church or just something, oh, or they get a picture or, and then they go around, oh, is that you or is that me? Mm -hmm. so they've heard from God, but then they start in this cycle of yes. double-mindedness. Yes. Is that you or is that me? What? But you see, James chapter one says double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't expect mm. that person to receive anything from God. It's the worst, most, the most faithless flipping. Oh, it's the worst kind Absolutely, of yeah. Yeah. Thing that someone can get into. So at, once, at some, so it's interesting when I have conversations with someone in that, that, that predicament, I'll say to them, so what, so, so, what do you think God said? What was that thought? So they'll share it. Well, what makes, what makes you think that it was you? And like, I think you're giving yourself far too much credit. You've been praying to God, God, I, I, I speak to me. Oh God, I want to hear from you. And Luke 11 says, if you ask for bread, he doesn't give you a stone. If you ask for fish, he doesn't give you a serpent. He loves to give the Holy spirit to those who ask. That's right. And he finally does it. And then you're going, oh, what if that's, is that me? Is that you? Is that me? Just take the step of faith. If it's in line with the Bible, if it's not heresy, is it going to, but some things are so easy to discern if, if it's God or not. Mm. Sometimes we get good ideas and they're actually God ideas. Yeah. But we think, oh, that's a good idea. And it is actually a God idea. We often talk about the reverse. Not every good idea is a God idea. But what about the good ideas that are God ideas? Mm -hmm. And I, I think if anything's good, I'm going to give, give the glory to him. It's this, yeah. well, what if it's from you? I'm not that clever. And my flesh isn't that interested in anybody else. So, you know, get a thought. Go across the road and, and, and see if the neighbour across the road's okay. And go and take them a meal. Yeah. Oh, is that you? Is that you, God? Oh, that's just me. No, no, it probably isn't you because your flesh isn't that unselfish. Your that's flesh right. isn't interested in anyone else or anything else except yourself. Yeah. Yes. If it's the devil, the devil isn't interested in blessing anybody <laughs> either. I mean, that's all oh, it's the devil. I'm not talking to the devil. He's not even in the equation. Yeah, that's right. What well, you know, I know when he speaks, it's when I start getting confused. It's when mm -hmm. I, 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 I get afraid when I, that, that's when he speaks he's easily identified yeah but but i i just i default if i'm if i'm asking god i'm gonna believe it's him absolutely so what are some of the ways that god has spoken to you vicky so i mean you know some people hear god in dreams Sometimes yep. it's more like an unction, like this, this impression, yep. this feeling. Yep. For feeling, me, yep. for me, I get those. That's how I feel God speaks to me. Yes. Um, yep. And that's kind of hard to explain too. It's like this, mm, you know what I mean? Like, yes, that's uh, exactly what it is. Yeah. For, for example, for our listeners, when I was praying, God, just show me if, 
if Dan is the right man for me to marry. I was praying for direction and, and actually somebody, um, a, an intercessor at our church had come up to me and said, I had this vision of you. You were playing keyboard on the stage and as I did because I was part of the worship team at the time. She's like, and I saw this big diamond on your finger and I stopped her and I said, wait a minute, how big was the diamond? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah but so I really felt because I'd been praying at that time Lord is he the right man for me I felt like that was God's way of confirming for me but then maybe a week or two later I remember I was in my room and I was making my bed and once again I was praying the familiar prayer Lord just show me is he the right man for me you know like just confirm for me and then all of a sudden for me it was this mm, like I had just been almost like reprimanded I've already spoken to you, but it wasn't audible and it wasn't words placed into my mind. It was like, yes. it was like this, mm, like this feeling yeah. like I had received yeah. that message. So yeah. there are lots of different ways. Do you feel like God speaks to you in lots of different ways or for you? Is it more? Yeah, one way it did, look, it did. look um, I would say mostly on a personal level um, and incidentally, just because you're a prophet doesn't mean that you have any special advantage in hearing God's voice for yourself. I'm just mm. child of God, one of the sheep. And yeah. uh, for me, it would be mostly um, like you, just the, the feeling, like mm. the, um, that impression and, uh, and hearing. Like I, I often will just get a thought, just yeah. a, yeah. Um, or, you know, something, some scripture will pop into my head or, um, even sometimes a scriptural reference and I have to look it up. Psalm 54. Okay. What's that? I'll go have a look and there'll be something. Yeah. You know, so uh, when I'm, when I'm praying, I, I will sometimes see pictures, but they're really quick, black and white for the most, just whoosh, very hazy. I mean, some people I know have full technicolor visions, you know, sense around sound, 3D. Wow. That'd be pretty cool. You know, they got they got they got Avatar going on there. Yeah. Uh, for me, they're whoosh. They're very quick, very simple. Mm -hmm. um, Would you say that when you're praying for someone and you hear a word from God for them, it's like the first thing that just pops into your mind? Yeah, for sure. Mm. But it doesn't pop into my mind until I do start praying. Yeah. So it's not before you start praying; it's as you start praying for them. Yeah. 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 So I've got to stir it. I've got to stir it up. Um, open my mouth before mm -hmm. God fills it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, when I first started out, I'd, I'd have God to give me stuff to say before I opened my mouth. But as I went on oh. and on and on, less and less and less. So still needs to be a faith thing. Yeah. So less like holding your hand as you come along. 100%. And more. Yeah. 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 Just boom. So if somebody, let's just say that somebody comes to you and gives you a like quote unquote, a word from God, would you yeah. say there are some tests to yes. be able to decipher, discern whether that is actually a word from God? I'll give you an example. Yeah. I was once just holding my newborn baby and I was in church and I was worshiping God and somebody, someone who had been coming to our church for years, like I, I really loved them, a great older gentleman, um, tapped me on the shoulder and, and in his thick accent, very, like surprised me and said, in four years, you will have a baby boy. <laughs> and I was just like gobsmacked because I was completely not expecting that at all. I had just had my second <laughs> child and um, I did not know what to do with that word. And so I just, um, and that particular person had never before revealed themselves as having the gift of prophecy around me. Uh, I had never known them to give anybody a word. And I was just like, what on earth do I do with this? And, you know, the funny thing is um, he did keep coming up to me. Like the next time I was pregnant, I was pregnant um, maybe oh, a year later with a girl and he came up to me, he's like, it's a boy, it's a boy. I'm like, didn't you say four years? But, and so for me, I, I just had to like put that on did the shelf. Did it come to pass? Three and a half years later, it did. So I don't know. Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, wow. Yes, yes, it did. But it, I mean, the timing was similar, but not timing exactly. Is a hard, timing's a hard thing to get yeah. for anyone. Like, you know. Yeah. But 
but it was it was cool because when I was pregnant with my fourth child, we always waited to find out. Like we didn't find out what the gender was, but I did actually when I was worshiping God, sorry, right before I fell pregnant with my fourth child, we hadn't even decided that we were going to have a fourth child. And mm. during the worship, I had just been praying to God, Lord, I really want a son. I'm not sure if I want to be pregnant again, but I really want a son. And then during, like after the worship, during the time where we got to turn around and say hello to somebody, the woman who was just visiting at our church, um, it was like a first time there. I turned around and said hello to her. And she said, I just feel that God is saying that, that that thing that you were crying out to God for, he's just about to give it to you. And a few months later, we unintentionally <laughs> fell pregnant. <laughs> it turned out to be a boy, which was fantastic because that was just like oh, such wow. a fulfillment of the desire of my heart. But going back to my original point is that what are the tests for when somebody does come up to you? Because I've, I've personally received, I've definitely received false words from God yeah. like for example uh, yeah. I knew God was calling me to Bible college I was just about to go and then a family friend came to me and said I just hear the words no college no college oh I've had and something I, like that happen once yeah <laughs> I had someone come up to me once they went danger northwest danger <laughs> I, was, I was about to fly off to Broome Western Australia for ministry Seriously. and I'm like oh my gosh <laughs> what do I do I'm like oh I never had anything like that what did you do I rang a few friends. I got a few spiritual friends to pray mm -hmm. and I, there were four of them and three of the four said, ignore it. And, the, and, and one of them was really like super confident and she had all these scriptures and, um, and which really released the burden Fantastic. off me. Yeah. But, um, it was so funny because I remember when I was when I went to Broome, um, had a day off and I went bodyboarding, like just had a, a, a at um, at the beach and I got dumped big time. And literally, as 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 I was getting dumped, I thought, "This is it. This is the danger." <laughs> danger. <laughs> danger, Will Robinson. I'm I'm, yeah, I'm a goner. But, um, but, but that, yeah, that was a long time ago, so I'm still yeah. here. But yeah, in terms of the tests. Look, a big test is who is it? Mm -hmm. Who are they? Do you know them? Do you trust them? Mm -hmm. Do they love you? What's the fruit of their life? What's the fruit of their life? Have they got a good track record? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's the spirit at, uh, out of which it's come? You know, because some people can bring a true word, but with a bad spirit. You know, they're... You know, their motive is to, you know, control or to manipulate. Their motive might be to big note themselves. And um, I, I always say to people, you're not under any obligation to receive any prophetic word from anyone. So when people, and in fact, I don't even go up to people um, privately and say, oh, I've got a word from God from, for you. I will... I will have a conversation because revelation can come through conversation. And I, and I will say, look, I, I think, or, you know, I just got this feeling or, you know, I, if I feel like I've got a word from God, like I'll do it in public with witnesses. Mm -hmm. It has to be judged. Let the prophet speak and let the others judge. Um, so if they tick those boxes, if you think, okay, that's, yeah, I know them. I love them. They've got good fruit. Um, I trust them. Um, if the word doesn't make any sense, I, I, I say, well, it doesn't make sense today. It might make sense tomorrow. So don't be too quick to totally dismiss, tear it up, say, oh, that's rubbish, you know. But the shelf is there for a reason. I have no problem with people putting my words on the shelf. Yeah. And don't ever lose sleep. People get anxious and they're, you know, concerned. Um, don't ever lose sleep over a prof prophecy. Yeah. You know, it's um, just let it go. And if yeah, it's God, he'll right. bring it back at another time somewhere. Like I've had words like that that I reacted to to start off with. Um, mm -hmm. And really it's just, it was, was my immaturity. 
um, in my, and it all got triggered. Like certain words can bring, can trigger people, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but then God brought it back and brought it back. And then sometimes a word that, that you don't like, I remember um, a pastor having a word for me. I see a lonely time coming, a lonely time. Well, I was in a serious relationship with plans to get <sighs> married and I'm like, okay, lonely time can only mean one thing. Yeah. I'm not liking the sound of this. No. And so I was really not happy and like, I didn't hear that, reject that. Mm -hmm. But the relationship broke up and when, and, and that prophecy, which was, I, I didn't like it. It actually mm -hmm. turned out to be very comforting because there were promises attached uh, to the lonely time. Yeah. And so that word came off the shelf because what can seem like a curse could, today can be a blessing tomorrow. Yeah. So, um, so you know, just um, is it in line with scripture? Yeah. Um, that's not as cut and dried either as what people think because someone had prophesied over me in uh, 1986 that in, in my home church in Perth, I was going to be a prophet. That would have been rejected as a false prophecy because it didn't fit in with their understanding of the word of God at the time. But in 1992, that movement changed their stand on women in ministry. And they do recognize and ordain women now, but um, yeah. So it's, it's, that can be, um, that is not so the, cut and dry, you yeah, know, the, but it, all, yeah. it's all these tests together. Okay. The, 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 we talk about the test of the inner witness. That's quite subjective. That's actually not, um, not as reliable as what people think because we will rarely witness to something that we disagree with. Yeah. Um, I did not witness to there's a lonely time coming. <laughs> no, that's right. Did not fit in with um, my reality, my plans and my desires, nothing. Mm -hmm. But it was a true word. Brought in love by a very godly Baptist pastor, beautiful man of God. Um, and so it's not so cut and dry. There is no foolproof way of being 100% correct mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to judging yeah. a word. But some things are very clear. And the other thing, Mel, actually is really important, um, Oh, forget the, the reference, but the scripture, we have the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. We have the mind of Christ. Not me. We. And it's, it's really important to include others in the process, especially if it's about something significant. Yeah. If you, you know, so, um, you know, uh, when I, um, met Damien and was going through that process of, okay, is he the one, what's happening? Is this, you know, is God mm -hmm. in this, you know, the um, opinion of my pastor, the opinion of my mom, um, other mature friends of mine, how do you feel? What do you think? Can you pray about this? You know, um, that was important because we have the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. When I get a, if I receive a prophetic word and, you know, if, if I'm unclear about it or I, I get others, I've got a prayer team, get them to pray into it. Um, so yeah, that's, there's quite a number of things we can do Yeah. to, okay. to judge a word. Yeah. That's good. That's really, that's really helpful. And so to ha just, I'd like to remind our listeners through that prophecy is a gift and it's a gift that's would you agree Vicky that the Bible says that it's a gift that's available to all of us and that oh, the Bible says to eagerly desire yes. the gift of prophecy and Paul also talks to Timothy about stirring up the yes. flame of the gift that he has how would you encourage someone who believes that they do have the gift of prophecy to fan that flame and stir up that gift yeah well um I will even talk to those who don't and let them know they can simply ask for it. Great. Like it's not, yes. we all, like you said correctly, first Corinthians 14, 31, we all mm -hmm. can prophesy. Yeah. Um, and 
Paul said, yep, desire, eagerly desire. And, um, and so we can ask for those things we desire. Then once you have, then you actually have to use it. You have yeah. to step out in faith. God doesn't just speak through your mouth. You know, he doesn't take over, you mm -hmm. know, and you don't have any choice. It, it's now something that you have access to, something you can activate. Yeah. And, um, and so now what was the question? How that, would you activate that gift? How do you activate it? You activate it um, firstly by, it depends on your, on your, on your setting. Because I always say to people, you need to understand the protocol of your local church. Some people think, I've got this gift. I can just use it anywhere, anytime. Mm -hmm. um, let's go. But especially when you're at church, you need to know, well, what's the order of things here? When oh, Often most churches, they um, allow you to prophesy in connect groups um, mm -hmm. or youth group or some, you know, some sort of um, setting like that. So be clear on that. But for, for me, you know, for years where I prophesied more than anywhere was out there in the marketplace, at work, at wherever I went, <laughs> the hairdressers, the nail technician, the physiotherapist. Wow. Um, How did yeah, that look? So, yeah, I just asked God, you know, I'd be, I just, I would live as if I was on a mission from God. I would live with my spiritual antenna up. Lord, today lead me to anyone who is needing encouragement, anyone who's prayed the prayer, God, if you're real. Mm -hmm. And so I just believe that the remote control of heaven is, is on us all. And he's just beaming us, you know, the steps of a good man and a good woman ordered by the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I would, you know, say, look, I, I just, I'm a Christian. Often I'd say, look, I'm a Christian. And, um, you know, I've just believe God wants to say this to you. I believe. And I was like, you know, back in the early days, I was incredibly bold. Uh, <laughs> I've kind of tempered things a bit these days. Yeah. Um, but I would, um, I mean, often, uh, Mel, I would ask if I could pray for them. Mm -hmm. That's how I would start out, if I had that opportunity. But you're not always, if I was on a bus and I felt God suddenly, you know, I remember sitting in front of an old man once, and this is in the days when you had the Walkmans. Remember the old yeah. Walkmans? Headphones. This old bloke, yeah. yep. This old bloke had a, a transistor radio listening to the horses, listening to races on the bus. Like, wow, yeah. And um, I thought Lord say to me, uh, give him your Walkman. Because I had a radio thing on there as well. Yeah. And, um, and as I was about to get off the bus, so I just handed it to him. And I explained to him and I said, look, this is a gift from Jesus. Uh, he told me he wanted to give this to you. Now I knew when I did that, the whole bus is hearing me. <laughs> I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried about giving away my walkman or even sharing with the old man, but just the fact that the whole bus is going to hear me. So I waited until yeah. just before I was about to get yeah. off. And then bolt. <laughs> uh, and then bolt. Um, so, so uh, just understand that it does take faith and you're never a hundred percent sure ever. I'm still not whenever I minister, there's always got to be a degree of doubt. Otherwise it's not faith. Because we're stepping out on, on impressions and, and sometimes just this hunch or this, like this whisper and um, be faithful with a little and God will give you more. So mm -hmm. be faithful with what he's given you. And um, I think every Christian needs to learn <coughs> what it is to feel the pain of regret. Because Ooh. when you felt the pain of regret, really really harshly um you'll you'll never miss an opportunity again mm -hmm. i say the pain of obedience is a lot less than the pain of regret and yeah. uh i had an opportunity once and i um i resisted because i was embarrassed i was self-conscious there i was and um and i didn't and it's like god allowed me to sit with that with that heaviness and honestly, it's almost like I felt the Holy Spirit say, you know, you, what if you were the opportunity for that woman to encounter me? And she was pregnant at the time and suffering really bad morning sickness. And I felt the Lord wanted me to pray for her for healing. This was early on, on my Christian walk, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it was a good lesson to learn because I learned from that point on, do you know what? If I end up with egg in my face, so be it. Put the egg, yeah. the omelette, I don't care. Um, because 
the pain of obedience is a lot less than the pain of regret. And you learn as you go. There's no other way with prophecy except to learn on the job. Mm-hmm. There's no other way. Hebrews 5.14 says that we learn to distinguish between good and evil through reason of use. And so it simply means that we learn what's God and what's not just by doing it. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, mm, that no, I, I missed it there. Ah, and, and it, you're not condemned. You've learned. Yeah. You've learned something. Um, or you, you, you get, you realize someone's blessed, someone's touched and you think, okay, that, that was God. Wow. I'm surprised. Like I, I had a, had a vision a few years ago, which has turned out to be one of the most uh, in, probably important revelations God's ever given me about the, the, the future church. And, um, it came to me so quickly and in seconds and like this flash, um, and even now, after all these years, it's like I learned something new about how God speaks, that, that he can weighty, important, significant words can, can come in such an unassuming way. Yeah. Without much fanfare or, <laughs> you know, I would have thought something like that would have oh, been an open vision or, a, you know, like this encounter caught up in the heavenlies but it was literally like a huh (laughs) when can you miss it when can you miss it yeah yeah but you learn these things just Mm -hmm. simply through experience so i'm aware that time is getting on but i've got two more questions for you and then i've got just a couple of fun questions yeah um so the first question is Going back to, we started to talk about the difference between having the gift of prophecy and having the office of prophet. Yes. For somebody today who they have got the gift of prophecy, they know that and they use that yes. gift. Um, how would they know whether or not they also have the office of, of a prophet? For uh, you, yeah. you actually had somebody call it out because they yeah. recognize that on your life. But for somebody yes. else, um, is that what it takes or is there another way that you can know? Yep. Good question. It's like there's a, a, a personal revelation that's got to come, but there has to be a public acknowledgement okay. of that for you to function. Yeah. All those fivefold ministry gifts are, are leadership gifts. I mean, they are positions, well, not positions, but functions mm-hmm. of responsibility within the church. And so um, others do need to recognize that. I would say, um, never announce yourself, yeah. you know, as, as a prophet. Um, like I said, I've, I've only started self-proclaiming after, you know, 28 years. Uh, but it's, it's let, let others call it out. Yeah. And right. often you will, um, one of the most important preparations for a prophet is, uh, is, is to die to the need to speak and to die to the need to be heard. And so often prophets do go through this, um, season, often a long season of being in obscurity, of not being recognised. Um, and, and there's still some prophets, um, you know, that, um, that because, of, because of their particular kind of religious or, uh, you know, the, the, how can I put it? There are prophets in all parts of the body of Christ and, and, mm-hmm. and some of them would be in, in traditional churches and orthodox churches and all sorts of places where they're not actually called that. They're still functioning as that. Yeah. Um, because they're, they're, they're recognised as, as called in some capacity. So um, because it's, 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 not, it's not like there's a clear career path for a prophet. It's not like, okay, someone feels a call to a pastor, they go to Bible college, get trained, they get interned. They, it's like there's this clear path. But at the moment for a, for a prophet, it's not so clear cut. But um, God will make it clear yeah. on both levels. Okay. Personal and public. Personal and public. And you know what the funny thing is? I cannot remember what the second question was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at my friend. Hang on, let's just see if I can find it. Um, no, it's gone. Oh well, it doesn't matter then. That's great. 
Okay. So the two questions that are just for fun is mm. what is the favorite, your favorite room in your house? Okay. You're going to find this, um, find this hilarious. We've only got, uh, we're in a one bedroom apartment. So we've only okay. got, including the, the bathroom and laundry, there are four rooms. Where I am is in, in the, um, this is an extension of our bedroom, this space that I'm in now. So my favourite room is the balcony. I <laughs> Because um, I can actually, you know, I yeah. can get some fresh air and uh, it can be, be a bit cooped up in here. I'm constantly saying I'd like to, the Sydney, Sydney can, um, can be a bit challenging in the real estate department so yeah and so expensive that's what i'm talking about <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so uh yeah so uh that's what balconies my husband are nice. the balcony yeah. yes yeah yeah fantastic. i like getting that's out good. there yeah yeah and what is your all-time favorite book that you've ever read oh that's a really hard question because i'm an english graduate and I, I've, I've read a lot of I've read a lot of books over the years. Um, it's like I've got favourite books in different categories. Um, I would say, in terms of books that really influenced me, "Good Morning Holy Spirit" by Benny Hinn was um, mm. was a was a game changer for me. It really just awakened me to. Um, the reality of the Holy Spirit, and I, it just set something alight on the inside of me. So it mm. it, it changed my life. Um, so did a book called Tramp for the Lord by Corrie Ten Boom, and um, Corrie Ten Boom was a Holocaust survivor mm. who would travel the world. Dutch lady traveled the world, speaking on forgiveness because she f forgave the Nazis, and um, she had lost her entire family. Yeah. Um, in the concentration camp. And I remember reading her story because she would just travel, travel in ministry and, and uh, she would just turn up to places with no money and God would provide. She'd go to, air, go to airports with no tickets. And, wow. and I remember reading that as a young Christian and, um, yeah. and my mind was blown and, mm -hmm. and not knowing that one day I'd be uh, living a similar life. Um, so yeah, so they're, the, they're, they're two, uh, Christian books that have really impacted me. Um, I love Jane Eyre, but that's a, a novel like that. Um, mm -hmm. I was about to do honors in, in, um, in my degree, but I took a different direction. I was going to do a thesis on Jane Eyre as Christian literature. Oh, really? So I, I read, yeah, I read Jane Eyre and it's like, um, it's, it's like Pilgrim's Progress. You know, it's, oh. a, it's a Christian story. Yeah. So um, I still love Jane Eyre. But yeah, like I said, it's hard for me just to pick one all-time book. The book Faith by Phil Pringle um, as well was a book that really impacted me. Um, yeah. Gee, I don't know when he wrote it. It must have been the 90s, I think. Maybe even the 80s. Um, yeah. Not knowing that one day he would be my senior pastor. <laughs> but um, Really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that 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 really um, really impacted me as well. So mm -hmm. heaps of books have impacted me. Yeah, hard just to have one favorite. Do you have a book in your heart that you feel like maybe one day? I'm I'm writing one as it as it so happens. Really? I'm up to four. <gasps> well <laughs> I've been done. talking about writing a book for fifteen years plus. Yeah, and um, a few people encouraged me in this season where I wasn't hopping on, on a plane, you know, every, mm. every week to um, seize the moment. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm actually writing a book on hearing the voice of God. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I'm writing it. I'm writing. A, it's called living in the God zone, a crash course in hearing the voice of God for absolutely everyone and anyone. So it is, I hope, my, my, my prayer is that it will be the sort of book anyone could read yeah. and understand. Yeah. Anyone. And I'm literally covering everyone from, you know, the seeker who doesn't know the Lord, the new mm -hmm. ager, the traditional church person, yeah. you know, a new Christian, a mature Christian, 
spirit filled, not spirit pissed, anyone, mm -hmm. even something that, that Christians feel they could hand to their friends because it's going to lead to an opportunity yeah. for make a decision at the end. But um, yeah, so I'm just trying to break it down and make mm -hmm. it as, as accessible as down to earth. I'm trying to demystify something that's actually yeah. very mysterious earth, mm -hmm. something that's very heavenly yeah. and very supernatural. So um, yeah, so that's great. Crossed, I'll finish it. <laughs> great. Do you have to, I went, let me know. I mean, I'll, I'll just keep on following you on Instagram. I'll find out when you yeah. do launch it, but yeah. I want to plug it because I just believe that that is a very important there is a very important need for that. And like you said, all of those audiences that you are aiming for, you've been each of those, yeah. those people, haven't you? Like you've come yeah. up from a yeah. very traditional church background. You've been the You know what? Person. I had, I had never thought of it like that, but, um, but I did tick quite a few of the boxes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, and the, you're educated too. So you'd be speaking to the educated yeah. I yeah. mean, so the other night, just very quickly, the other night I, um, I cut my finger on a tuna can. I was wondering what you'd done. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sliced it. And, oh, um, I'm, ter I'm terrible. Like I almost fainted. <laughs> I'm a real baby when I cut myself. It's hilarious. Oh, uh, but anyway, I went to an unplanned trip to the emergency and it was interesting because I had two male nurses and I was having good chats with these guys and, um, I was telling them actually that, that I'm a podcaster and explaining what my podcast is about. And I, I mentioned you, I said, I'm actually interviewing a prophet tomorrow night. Um, neither of the, these guys know, know God. And, um, and I was like, I just want to talk to her about how to hear from God. How do you recognize when God is speaking to you? And one of, one of them, he's a young guy in his 20s and ex-army guy. And he was like, yes, I want to know that. He's like, oh, wow, I, that's I, cool. Yeah, he's like, I, sometimes I think, is that God or is that me? So, you oh, know, like even wow. in church, people want to know, how do you hear from God? So it's, it's just so important. Oh, that, that's your, it, um, and they're going to clairvoyance and they're going to psychics to yes. try and. People want to connect. Hear from God. People do yeah. want to connect. Yeah, and they're much they're more great. spiritually open than, um, than yeah. they're often given credit for. And I, and I believe God can speak to anyone yes and he yeah. does, like he spoke to me before i actually got born again like that i can see times in the lead up yeah god clearly spoke to me so yeah. um that's good that's really encouraging yeah great i'll write my book with him in mind yes do it do it um okay so i actually remember what that last question was oh okay <laughs> It's funny that you got it because it's, it's a bit of a biggie. It's the one um, where, what do you feel that God is saying to the church in Australia during the season? Look, I, I felt from, like from the outset, I, I felt like there was a rebooting taking place, a reset, a recalibration. I saw these, um, you know, the um, defibrillators mm -hmm. that they use on the heart patients bring the heart back into rhythm and I felt God wanted to bring us back into rhythm um, back into his rhythm yeah. um, I I uh, I see I see the wine skin changing I'd been preaching and prophesying on that for a couple of years in the lead up and um, I have a video on YouTube called the Rubik's Cube Church mm -hmm. that people can watch and um, it just unpacked a vision that I had of the new wine skin that new wine, new wine skin for, for the next season. And when all this COVID craziness, you know, started, I thought the Lord say to me, the Rubik's cube is in full swing. Now what that represented was, was just a whole lot of shifts. So I had this picture of Jesus with the Rubik's cube and he, he started moving it so quickly. It was just a, a spin. It was like literally a blur of motion. And, um, and, and I felt him say that there was, that, that it was going to be all these paradigm shifts. Each one of these spins represented a paradigm shift. And what he did, he actually messed up the Rubik's cube. That's what he did. 
he took one that was nice and solved and, and he messed it up. Actually, have I got it? Yeah, I've got it with me. Sorry, it's in my, it's in my desk. You've got one. And he kind of, yeah, and, um, and he messed it up and he didn't even put it as a cube. He kind of oh. said it like that. Yeah. And he said what he was going to do would seem counterintuitive. It wouldn't be what people would expect. Um, but there was going to be a revival of creativity, not limited to the arts. Wow. Um, he, he used all these pops of colour. I believe that, like the, um, you know, diversity and, and in the individuals, individ the, the glory within individuals. I think people being empowered and being released and equipped is really important. Um, but there still would be, I felt him say, people. some people will say, hey, this is chaotic. Some people go, oh, that can't be God. But he said, there'll still be design. There'll still be connection. Um, I feel it's going to be, the, the, the church of the future is going to be more flexible. It's going to be, um, but there's still connection and there's still, um, you know, it, it's still, as I said, design and intelligence behind it. It's not random, mm. but it's different. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm reminded as well of, um, my friend Murray Newman, who's a prophet from the central coast, he um, likens it from the difference between the pool of Bethesda, like uh, the church has been like the pool of Bethesda. Come, 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 come to church, come to church, jump in the pool mm -hmm. and um, wait for the stirring and something, something will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's compared to Ezekiel 41 and it talks about the river of God that flows out from under the, the door of the temple. And um, I, I, I just I just believe that um, we 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 we've, we've got to break out of the things that stop us really getting into the into the community and into the world and really yes. making a difference. Yeah. Um, we can't just be dependent on people coming, coming, coming. There's yeah. got to be a next level mm -hmm. of um, of release. Yeah. Um, and, and I just feel like there's so much unfulfilled potential in people. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so this season um, is, is, a, is a time for people to reset personally on a personal level. Yeah. But I believe it's going to have ramif ramifications, obviously, already. You know, like we can't do church the way we used to. That's and right. I think it'd be sad if we just went back to doing church the way we used to. Yeah. I think we're meant to learn from this. We're meant to, like, say, God, like, like it's not us to work. It's up to us to work out. He wants to take the lead. He wants to take the reins. And so rather than try and work out, God, how's church going to look like now? What saying, okay, Lord, how do you want it to be? Yeah. You know, it's still in motion. It's still early days. I believe it's still early days. It, mm -hmm. I, I know that it looks like that we've um, escaped the worst of, um, of this, you know, initial virus. Um, you know, the impact has, has not been as, as bad for Australia mm -hmm. as what it was initially expected. And I even think we're going to economically as a, as a nation, I really believe the Lord's shown me that we're going to recover well. Great. Um, I know we are officially in recession now, but um, I'd be very surprised if it's long lived and I'd be very surprised um, if it, if it's a deep recession, I, mm -hmm. I feel that the Lord's shown me that we as a nation are going to do well comparative to other nations of the world. In actual fact, other nations are going to look to us mm -hmm. um, in, um, you know, with interest as yeah. to how we have yeah. um, weathered this season so well. It's going to be the favour of God as I believe Australia's yeah. season and time is, um, is coming where we're going to be, front and centre yeah. for uh, a number of uh, great reasons. So, yeah, that's, 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 that's what I feel. I think it's an exciting time. I mean, it yeah. started off like being far out. It was, it was, I think I had a panic attack in the first 24 hours, just like, oh, my gosh, mm -hmm. how, how, how is this, how are we going to live? What are we going to do? Yeah. But God has just, um, has, has just met many people in the midst of this. Yeah. I've, I've, I've heard incredible stories of people who've been away from church for ages who are now encountering God afresh. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, the season of the divine paradox 
It is not how it appears. <laughs> That's great. That's so good. Thank you for sharing that with us, Vicky. Would you like to finish up by praying for our listeners? Absolutely. We'd love to. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would just touch. Touch each one. Each one who is listening, no matter who who they are, no matter where they are. I thank you. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are not in lockdown. I thank you, Lord, right now, that your word is not in quarantine. And I thank you that your, your presence, your presence is not restricted by time or geography. And, and, and I just release right now Father God, an increased sense of your presence to every person listening. And Lord, I pray for confidence, confidence that we are your sheep and we hear your voice. Father, I take authority over confusion in Jesus' name. And Father, to ones who are going through a tough time right now, Lord, as a result of the coronavirus and, and ones who are going through tough time financially, Lord, relationally. Father, maybe even ones who have been affected directly or indirectly by the virus. Father, Lord, I'm not making light of these matters. Lord, there are natural realities. Yes, and and I, I, I just speak right now, Father, for the encouragement and the comfort of the Holy Spirit of those who are, Father God, um, really affected. I'm, I'm, I'm mindful there are those people, Father, with, um, who, who have mental illness and, 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 Lord, who suffer from anxiety and depression. And this has been really heightened in this season. Father, I pray right now that you would meet them, that they would, Father, encounter you in a new and powerful way. And I thank you, Father, you have answers, Father, for those right now who are seeking solutions. I thank you, Lord, that you are the good shepherd and you are good at your job and you lead your sheep, Father God. You cause us to lie down, Lord God, in green pastures. Lord, you lead us beside still waters. You restore our souls. I thank mm -hmm. you, Father, for the restoration of the soul of the church in Australia. I thank you, Father God, for recalibrating us and for bringing us back into rhythm, Lord, the unforced mm -hmm. rhythm of grace. Father, that we would not stress and strive and push to perform and to create, Father, um, things, Lord, that, that Father God, you, that uh, have, have done its due date, that, that have passed their expiry date, Lord, that we would be fresh and in season and flowing, Lord, with you and your purposes. I thank you, Father, for the new wineskin you're creating in our lives personally, in the church, corporately. And I thank you for the new wine. So thank you, Lord, right now. Touch each one. Touch each one, Lord. I really speak, Father, release and an activation of the gift of prophecy Amen. in people. I thank you, Father, for an activation of, of prophets in mm -hmm. Jesus' name. And Lord, for each one on their own personal prophetic journey, I thank you, Lord, that you are committed to seeing these callings come to pass in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Excellent. Thank you, Vicky. Thus finishes our interview. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you, Gal. My pleasure. So